And uh, welcome back to Christian Ethics. Uh, today we're going to be talking about questions of life and death. So up to this point, we have been examining lots of different approaches to ethics, um, starting with some kind of ancient medieval uh, approaches, moving into a little bit more modern, and then even to some uh, postmodern or post-foundationalist approaches to ethics as well. Um, last time we talked about uh, ethics from marginalized groups and some of the different approaches. That's going to play into fact really all of these different groups you're going to see come up in one way or another um, as we kind of move forward on with the course. From this point on, we're going to be looking at different topics and how those are approached uh, through different areas. So today, kind of the, the loose theme around everything is going to be questions of life and death. Um, so hoping to have some good uh, discussion. Uh, hopefully over on the discussion boards about this. Um, but with that, let's go ahead and just uh, move right into it. Um, so we're going to start off kind of the first half, roughly, is going to be talking about kind of beginning of life issues. Um, and so one of the first issues with beginning of life, before we even get to the, the biggie one, um, which uh, we, we will get to, um, but one of the earlier ones that comes up is um, birth control. Uh, and the, the question does come up. Um, it's less of a question for secular ethics, but it becomes a very important question uh, for Christian ethics. Now, depending on what your view of secular ethics is, it may be an issue for that as well. But uh, for Christian ethics, it becomes a very big issue. Um, in particular, if you look at divide between, uh, say, in America, between uh, Protestants and Roman Catholics, there's a big divide and debate on this about how, uh, you know, what the Christian attitude is towards birth control. Uh, and especially for those who come from a Roman Catholic standpoint, it's an ethical issue that they're dealing with. Uh, so the first thing that comes up is um, the idea of onanism. Um, now, onan, uh, if you recall um, your genesis, uh, was um, the brother-in-law of Tamar. Tamar's husband dies, um, and it, it describes that onan uh, basically goes in to fulfill his uh, you know, duty as a brother to provide offspring on behalf of his deceased brother. Um, he doesn't like the idea that his, uh, you know, the, the kids that are born are not going to be his, and so uh, essentially he, you know, pulls out and, as it says, it is he spills his seed on the ground. Um, and so a big question comes up, and in fact, um, oftentimes this is referred to uh, as sinful, especially like during the Middle Ages of what's known as Odinism, um, whether this basically any time that you uh, a male ejaculates not as part of sex. Um, so that, that's known as Odinism. Um, that is seen as um, kind of a negative consequence. You might call it like the pull-out method. Um, but in Roman Catholic circles, that's considered you know, not acceptable. Um, that's kind of like a, you know, a very narrow argument from that, and that really ends up being an issue more of interpretation than it does to be of ethics. And some contemporary is is issues that come up is, well, what forms of birth control are acceptable? Um, is surgical forms of birth control, uh, vasectomies and that sort, are, are those acceptable? Are those ethical? Uh, what well, about barrier methods? By far the most common method. Um, pharmaceutical methods, like taking the pill. Um, these are just different issues to think about. Um, and then is abstinence or selective abstinence? Um, with selective abstinence, you might think of something like the rhythm method. Um, for Roman Catholics, that's kind of, that last one's really the only acceptable means of birth control. Um, but these are just issues that come up that you have to start thinking about and thinking through. We're going to get into uh, some of the different approaches to these. Um, so the, the reason there's such a big difference among Roman Catholics is because they are basing most of that ethical theory upon the work of Thomas Aquinas, who in turn is based upon Aristotle. And what they're really looking at is natural law. And so the question becomes, can you have a natural law argument for um, birth control? And... For Roman Catholics, they're going to say, well, no, like the, the natural law, if we look at from nature, the law that we can derive from that is that um, sex should result in procreation, in creation of new life. That's what the point, that's what the purpose of uh, it is. Um, whereas Protestants are going to look more at the other aspects, the relational aspects, uh, believing that God has blessed the pleasure that's involved with that. And so it's not just about procreation. It's not only about procreation. So kind of where you fall on that spectrum is going to determine what your attitude or approach to uh, birth control as far as an ethical standard. This is something that comes up um, even in Protestant churches. So I know that we are 
interdenominational, um, almost entirely, or I think entirely Protestant. Um, so you may not have as much of an issue on one end, but it still comes up. Like, well, what about you know high school sex education? Should we talk about these different things? Like, what's the issue to talk about with these different, you know, ideas of birth control? Um, the second issue that comes up is uh, assistance with conception. So someone who wants to conceive, so now we're on kind of the, the opposite side. Before birth control, someone who doesn't want to conceive. Now we have someone who does want to conceive. So again, issues come up with what is acceptable here. Um, and Roman Catholics are still going to make the same appeal to natural law. So are there corrective uh, forms of assistance that are okay? Can someone undergo hormone therapy if they have like low hormones? And that's the reason why they don't have you know, either sperm or egg production. Um, is corrective surgery acceptable? If you're uh, you know, really strong uh, you know, Christian science um, or certain forms of Jehovah's Witness, uh, you're not going to be okay with that. Um, that. That form of medical intervention is going too far. Uh, so you're, you're not going to be okay with, with that kind of conception. You believe that God has ordained the human body, every human body, exactly as it should be, and we should not put our cells in the place of God. So that becomes an issue. Um, bigger issue, again, particularly with Roman Catholics, is the issue of artificial or lab-based. Um, and so here you have, um, you know, IVF is in vitro fertilization, um, other forms of hormone therapy, um, or, you know, artificial insemination. Um, so that's kind of what the IAH, IAD is, uh, the artificial insemination, IVF is in vitro fertilization, where they um, have the fertilization external to the, the body and then they take some of the um, fetuses and they implant them into the body. Um, and so kind of where do you fall on that? Uh, probably quite tellingly, um, your view of IVF may be directly proportionate to where you fall on the spectrum when we get to the bigger issue that kind of dominates this conversation when we talk about abortion. Um, so uh, we're going to save some of that until we start talking about abortion. But uh, just kind of to start thinking about it now that these are not distinct categories, that they are all somewhat related. Um, another issue comes up with genetic engineering. Um, the topic always comes up about eugenics. Um, and, you know, clearly, I think from, from most people from a Christian perspective, eugenics is not okay. Um, but then you get into some kind of gray areas when you talk about medical research um, and is it okay to use um, fetal tissue or fetal uh, stem cells or embryonic research uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with medical research that could save potentially hundreds, thousands, millions of lives, uh, perhaps even billions of lives. At what, where do you draw that line um, when we talk about that kind of thing? Um, also about gene therapy, um, you know, should we, is it playing God to be involved with the gene therapy? Um, so managing gene therapy, as far as secular ethics is concerned, tends to be pretty, you know, widely accepted, but anytime you start editing the germ line, um, which is a much deeper seated kind of area of DNA, that's considered, like, we don't know what's going to happen, that, that's considered going too far beyond the bonds. So these are just, again, these are additional issues that we need to start thinking about when we start thinking about issues of life and death. Um, okay, so we're going to get to some kind of the approaches to these different views um, and how they, they you know, encounter that. So the, the deontological approach. Um, one way to approach these issues, including the issue of abortion and that kind of thing, is to think about, well, what is the purpose of sex? Um, like, what is the point of it? Um, a, uh, you know, uh, if you are going to say that um, it's fine to have birth control, um, or even if you're going to say be, you know, pro-choice and that kind of thing, often to, if you're going to be a deontologist, you have to come up with a different reason, a different idea for what the point of sex is. It's not just about procreation. Um, you have to start thinking, though, also about the, the second formulation of the categorical imperative, um, which or review says that um, you, essentially you can't use people as a means only. They always have to be used as an ends as well. So is it acceptable for sex to be about pleasure if that results in the creation of another human being? Are you using that 
resultant human being as a means to some other end without considering them as an end in, under themselves, uh, which would be you know, a very heavy argument in favor of all forms of birth control. Uh, so these are just you know, different things to think about with that and the more traditional category. Um, when we start talking about uh, choice, uh, which plays into both birth control and then later into abortion, when we talk about a virtue ethics standpoint, can autonomy, um, the ability to make that choice, can that be considered a virtue? Um, we can also think about in terms of a just allocation of resources. Is it more just to encourage birth control, especially among poorer communities, um, where there's less education and, uh, and, and, different, and less ability to support uh, family and that sort of thing. These are just additional issues. Uh, consequentialist ethics might look at the overall quality of life and society. Is society as a whole benefited by having ready access to birth control or by having ready access to uh, artificial means of um, you know, con conception um, or uh, the ability to choose uh, whether or not to have an abortion? Are these positives or are these negatives for society? They're things to think about. What are the broader implications of each of these different things? Are there further implications? Um, so kind of a, uh, on the negative side against um, something like abortion, you say, well, what type of society does that create if we don't value human life? That's a very consequentialist uh, argument for that. Uh, there's also general issues of equity because um, there is a big disparity in equity when we start talking about a lot of these issues is that in general, um, minority populations and poor populations where there's a lot of overlap between those two but even if you adjust for some of that overlap they still tend to be um, negatively impacted by lack of access to birth control um, they tend to have more negative consequences um, basically you're putting increased burden upon them um, that is not placed upon someone who's perhaps more affluent um, and so these are issues that come up when we start talking about these different things um, some more post-foundationalist approaches, and um, the reading on Howard Watson and things like that are going to get into this, but uh, we have to think about issues of status and poverty and gender, some of those marginalized groups that we were talking about. Um, but you need to think about issues of genetic engineering and selecting against certain populations. Is this a right thing or a wrong thing when we start looking at that? Um, also think about issues of uh, female autonomy, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit, a little bit more detail. Um, what is the role of parenthood, and can parenthood be seen as a vocation? Is it something that needs to be chosen, or is it something that's thrust upon people? Um, and then also going to start thinking about um, different ecclesiological responses. Um, the fact that the church supports life and supports uh, children and that, that sort of thing. So should there be a push toward uh, adoption and pursuing that as an alternative means? Um, and then another kind of approach from this post-foundational perspective is, should we decouple uh, the biological issue from the medical issue? So the, the question of genetics and you know, life, is that a separate issue from the medical issue of whether, what we are capable of doing and, and thinking about? It, this also has to do with things like health of the mother and, and questions like that when we, we come into that. Um, okay, so we're going to start talking about the, the kind of bigger issue the one that kind of dominates this conversation, um, which tends to be abortion. So let's look at some of the history of Christian stances to abortion. So there's no explicit, clear biblical mention for or against abortion. However, you do see um, injunctions very early on in the history of Christianity, and even before that among Jewish rabbis, against infanticide, which for all um, you know practical purposes was the early form of abortion. Now, there were other forms of abortion that were around, but this is roughly the, the closest analog from the ancient world to today. So early on, you have injunctions against that, um, from and, and universally uh, against that. In fact, a lot of the early church was kind of known for taking on all of these rejected children. Um, orphanages uh, started by Christians taking on these rejected children. You see evidence of this in some early documents, uh, the Didache, the letter of Barnabas, which is, is probably pseudonymous, but these are still in early Christian documents. It gives us evidence um, of rejection of infanticide, and perhaps even um, what was then practiced as abortion. Um, we come to Augustine and we get a lot clearer response, and this is definitely the response 
um, that the Roman Catholic Church is going to take and that you'll see some Protestants take as well. Um, for Augustine, the sole purpose of sexual intercourse is for the purpose of procreation. That is it. That is the only purpose behind it. So if that's the only purpose behind it, then issues of birth control or abortion um, are kind of resolved entirely. Um, you, you don't have to, you don't talk about those sort of things. To use those is sinful because you're using sex for some purpose other than procreation. Um, so that's why we have, as I've mentioned, we, we have that big, heavy Catholic Protestant distinction where a lot of Protestants do not sign on to this, and they do believe that there are other purposes behind uh, intercourse. Um, there's also big questions is more, it's still in the more traditional approach of understanding the fetus. At what point does a fetus or an embryo become a human person? And this is going to be a spectrum. So you're going to have people that are, say that they are pro-life or pro-choice, but they may actually agree as to where that line should be. Um, so a lot of European countries, for instance, which tend to be very heavy on the pro-choice, um, tend to not allow abortions um, after the first trimester or possibly after the second trimester. Uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find any of them allow that kind of late-term um, abortion standard. So that's you know that becomes less of an issue um, because there's roughly universal agreement about when that line is or where that line is. And we're going to talk about maybe why some of the reasons behind where that line is. Um, whereas in America, you don't have a very clear distinction as to where that is. In fact, consistently the Supreme Court has upheld that there is no like line at which point it's too late. Um, so let's, we can talk about this. So oftentimes you hear, and this is the Roman Catholic argument, that life begins at conception. Um, and it is true that you do have a distinct human biology at the point of conception. The issue here is that there are a lot of conceived, if that's what we're saying, sperm meets egg. That's what how conception is usually understood. Um, that at that moment, um, there's a lot of those fertilized eggs that never implant, never go anywhere. Um, they kind of the, the woman just has a normal period afterward. Um, so if life begins at conception, and by conception you mean this, you know, where the, you have a fertilized egg, that becomes very problematic because then from a natural standpoint um, or looking at the perspective of God, God becomes somehow responsible for the death of more people than we could possibly imagine. Um, now, I said human people because really what the issue is is not is this life. Because we kill things that are life all the time. These are human life. They have human DNA. Cancer cells um, have human DNA. Uh, in fact, they can mutate such a way that they have a distinct human DNA. So we have no problem killing off thing, that kind of things. But what we're really concerned with is at what point um, does whatever we're talking about transition to being a person? So there's some maybe issues with that if you if you believe life begins um, human life as a human person begins at that fertilization phase, then you're going to reject things like Plan B uh, and different things like that as well, um, which don't work to kind of terminate a pregnancy; they work to prevent implantation. But like I said, that's a natural process that happens quite a bit anyway. Um, so perhaps a stronger argument might be made for implantation. Um, so you do have this collection of cells, but then you also have issues of there's still a lot of miscarriages in women that don't even know that they have had um, an implantation. Uh, and if they do, then that, that's going to be what we might call a miscarriage, um, but they're not going to be completely unaware of that happening. Uh, there's something called the primitive streak. Once that kind of you know DNA structure or, or genetic structure starts to kind of take shape, uh, maybe that's the form. Um, Augustine... Um, who is a kind of strong argument? He he argues uh, that it really the human life it becomes a human person at what he refers to as the quickening. Um, now quickening is basically when you can feel movement, uh, when the woman can feel movement, it often as like a fluttering. Uh, in a lot of you know, medieval thinking, uh, this was the point at which the human um, you know body that's growing it receives a soul. Um, this is a very platonic idea, um, so you're not going to see a lot of evidence for this anywhere in the Bible. Um, but this is the idea that um, you have this human body growing, and so any time before this, it's not 
a human person death. It's just, you know, you're getting rid of cells. Um, or, I mean, they didn't have another chain of cells, but you get the point. But at quickening, um, it's when you have an ensouled human now inside of you. Uh, and so th there's a distinction there for Augustine. So we're going to say once you have the presence of brain waves, which is a later phase than that, when you have distinct set of brain patterns and brain waves that are going on. Um, the big line, and this is where most European countries kind of draw that line and draw that distinction, um, is uh, viability. Uh, so viability is the point at which uh, fetus uh, or embryo um, can survive outside of the womb. Um, not saying it's going to do well surviving, but it could survive. Uh, the argument being, well, why would have an abortion? You can just have the child at that point. Um, and so for a lot of people, this is where the line is. Once it reaches viability, then abortion is not acceptable at any point. And um, sometimes that's, that's defined very strictly as at 20 weeks. Um, it's probably a lot more fluid than that. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to say that you know, most uh, unborn uh, are, are actually truly 100% viable at 20 weeks. Um, but that's just kind of another issue. Um, some are going to go all the way up until birth. In fact, you'll see arguments that say, basically, any point prior to birth, it's not a human person. But once it's born, it becomes a human person. Um, there's even some arguments that will say after birth, once they're able to have an actual conscious discussion. And that's, that's probably going to the far, far extreme. You'd be hard-pressed to find a lot of defenders of that, but you will find some people um, that are going to be okay defending that view. So some other considerations to think about this. Um, so who gets to decide the rights of women? Um, and what do you do with issues of rape and incest? Um, is there an additional compulsion after someone has been manipulated or uh, perhaps you know, raped very violently? Are you going to continue? The, the perspective is that by forcing someone to continue on that pregnancy, uh, you're going to continue to violate them every day of that pregnancy on and, and afterward. Um, so that's why a lot of times you'll see exceptions for rape or incest and, and that kind of thing. You also have genetic de deformities that can ha happen. Um, lead to profound disabilities. Um, there are certain genetic, I, I know of, you know, there's one genetic disorder where uh, a child is born without a brain. Um, so if a child's born without a brain, it's not going to survive. Like we, we know that. It's actually very dangerous for the mother um, to give birth to a, this, you know, child that's born without a brain. So at what point, like, is there a point at which the disability is so profound that abortion is acceptable. In fact, it's even preferable. Um, and so you see there's a lot of arguments for that. And where is that line of distinction? Um, one question that often gets thrown out is, should we re require a child who is not wanted to be born? Is that putting too much on an infant by requiring that they be born? Um, system is, you know, from a consequentialist standpoint, the system's already very strained. What is that going to do to that child? What kind of psychology is that going to be placing upon the child? Is that going to harm the child in the long run? Um, other considerations. Does the father or not even the mother and father, people outside of that, do they have a right to the child, whether to be a father or to not be a father, um, to have a child born in the family or to not have a child from that other person born into their family? Um, these are other considerations to go on. What is the role of the state? In all of this, does the state have a role? Now, clearly, we tend to think the state does have a role. That's why there are laws and court cases and that kind of thing. Um, but what is that role? Is it to promote the family? Um, in which case, the state should always try to promote, uh, you know, encourage more births and that kind of thing. Is it to promote the general well-being of the populace? Well, here we get a little bit more nuanced approach. That could mean that in certain instances, perhaps even most instances, we allow for more choice about the matter. Um, these are just different considerations to go through. Um, what is the role of religion and state? Does re religion, does church, get to tell the state what to do with it? Um, on on these kind of broader societal considerations, like are, are we putting too much on society by requiring children that are unwanted to be born? All right, so from a feminist ethic standpoint, um, you, kind of, you have feminists who are arguing both you know, pro-life, pro-choice, pro-abortion, anti-abortion. Um, for the most part, 
uh, a feminist ethicist is going to say that this is not a dispassionate debate. This is not something cerebral, nor should it be. Um, this should be a very passionate debate. We're talking about very important and intimate details. The bigger question becomes, do men have any role in this debate? This is a question about women and women's bodies. Should men even enter into this conversation and discussion? And there's going to be some feminist ethicists who say no. Um, some of these societal concerns, we have to think about poverty, lack of uh, you know, social mobility, the life and well-being of the mother. Are these issues that are going to sway opinion one way or another? Um, something that comes up with a lot of this is that we can't talk just about the ideal world, which is where a lot of these conversations tend to get held up. We have to talk about the real world where we are now, it's embodied. That ideal world is too dispassionate. We're, we're not in an ideal world. We're in the real world. So how are we going to issue that? Um, so feminist ethicists who, especially those who are going to go in favor of a more pro-choice approach, are going to reject uh, Aristotelian potentiality. Um, so the Aristotelian argument is that um, you have you know, even as soon as you have conception, this is the Roman Catholic argument it's based upon Aquinas, based upon Aristotle, that a fertilized egg has potential to be a productive human. Um, because you have potentiality, even if it's not necessarily a human person at that point, it still has that potential for it. And because it has that potential for it, you should not put yourself in the place of God. You should be about the promotion of life. Well, feminist eth ethics... Uh, that's pro-choice is going to absolutely reject this and say that that's an artificial constraint. There is no potentiality. Um, there either is or isn't. Questions about potentiality is, again, that same problem with the ideal versus the real world. We're not dealing with what we think could happen. We're thinking about what is. And so if a mother decides not to carry through to term, that you know collection of human cells does not have potential as a human life, as a human person. Um, so that that's becomes a, a rejection of Aristotle at that point. Um, something that comes up is that a lot of times we're seen as addressing the wrong issues. Um, because we're spending so much time talking about abortion and pro-life, pro-choice and that kind of thing, we're actually missing the wrong issues. That instead we should be talking more about access to birth control, bigger education, better support for single mothers, that if you start dealing with these issues of poverty and support and that kind of thing, you're going to make abortion a less attractive option. And so really what we need to do is address these other issues. And then the issue of abortion or not abortion, pro-life, pro-choice, that becomes a secondary issue that we don't even really have to think about that much. Um, very few people are not, are going to view abortion as anything other than tragic. Um, so, you know, how do we deal with that? How do we uh, address that? If that's the case, then perhaps we can kind of cut things off. Perhaps these are wanted children, but they're not wanted given the current circumstances. So can we do something to address those current circumstances? Uh, and that kind of thing. That's another approach from a feminist ethicist perspective. Um, some more postmodernist approaches. Um, one argues is that the sanctity of life is a false argument. Um, and this is this is the argument of, of Stanley Hauerwas, um that we, we don't we're not really pro life. Um, we tend to you know talk a lot about death and talk about picking up your cross and dying. However, we should accept that a human life is meant to be welcomed. And that's kind of the flip side of that. Um, kind of going along with that, for the church, there's no question of personal rights. The mother shouldn't be talking about personal rights. She shouldn't be talking about the fetus potential as a human person. That is not the issue. The issue is, should we welcome human life or not? Um, compassion is also understood as, as distinct from just removing suffering. This is a big point in the how offering legacy. Um, so also start thinking about what is it that's going to build up the church? Um, and when we start talking outside the church, uh, so we may have, this is the, the Christian perspective of the church, can we even have this discussion across other communities, remember those language games that we're talking about, is that even possible to have this kind of cross-community discussion about these issues? Okay, that's kind of the, the big brief overview of that. We're going to be moving on now to more end-of-life issues. Um, so this tends to center around euthanasia and suicide, and what are the ethical concerns and issues related to those. So there's two primary concerns when we're talking about euthanasia and suicide. 
Um, first are the concerns related to autonomy and concerns related to pain and suffering. Um, so this is kind of, if, if you're going to be very heavy on the side of autonomy and against pain and suffering, then you're going to be probably much more pro-euthanasia or, or perhaps even suicide. So um, to be clear, there's no explicit condemnation of suicide. It's heavily implied as a condemnation, but there are several suicides mentioned in the Bible. Um, the principle for condemnation uh, seems to be derived more from the fact that God has sort of, uh, sovereignty over life, um, that thou shalt not kill, and extends to not killing yourself, uh, and different things like that. But you don't have an explicit do not kill yourself. Um, it is definitely heavily implied, but you don't see it as explicit. Um, euthanasia uh, is um, kind of the more softened version of that. Um, so let's look at kind of the more extreme view. Um, the more extreme view uh, says that euthanasia is acceptable um, through means of exposure, abandonment, executing the elderly, getting rid of infants, or significantly di disabled individuals. Um, that's an extreme view. Um, among Christian ethicists, you're not going to find a lot of support there. Um, but then you also have the distinction between involuntary or non-voluntary euthanasia. And here we have you know, active or passive forms. Passive is like withdrawing life support. Uh, and this is usually, the reason it's involuntary or non-voluntary is because you have a patient who cannot make that decision because they're in a coma or um, that perhaps they're brain dead or you know, whatever the effect is. They are not making that decision. It's made on behalf of them. And so if you talk about withdrawing life support versus you know, having an active agent that's introduced um, to like a, one kind of more accepted way is to increase the amount of morphine that someone has, um, which results in their death. Um, that's kind of that dual effect that we talked about earlier. So um, there tends to be a distinction drawn between active and passive, because uh, active seems a lot more involved. You're doing something. Whereas passive, you're just kind of letting nature take its course. You're withdrawing artificial means of support. Um, there's voluntary euthanasia. Uh, so you have, um, usually takes two forms, what's known as an advanced directive. If you work in the medical community, you should be familiar with this. This is where you make your wishes known under what circumstances you do not want life-saving uh, measures to be taken and different things like that, uh, or at what point you want uh, you know, artificial means of life support to be withdrawn, um, those types of things. And then, uh, you know, probably most controversially with this, you have uh, assisted suicide. Um, can someone voluntarily decide I want to die um, because of some medical compl complication or something like that. Um, again, you have this double effect that I, I briefly mentioned, but let's talk about a little bit more. So the double effect of euthanasia, if you recall, when we, we're, we're talking a little bit more about the you know, order bonum and different things like that. Does the intent of the medicine matter? Um, so if your intent is not to kill, but is to remove and re release suffering, Knowing that it may be high risk for life or death, but knowing that it might not necessarily kill someone, does that make it acceptable? Um, if your primary goal is to remove suffering, that seems to be a good. So if that's your primary goal, is it acceptable then that the kind of dual effect of that is that the person dies? That's a negative outcome. You don't want that to happen. But it, like, where is the ordering of it? What type of life? This is questions of quality of life come into and we start talking about that. Um, forms of suicide, suicide tends to be a little bit different. So with euthanasia, you talk about someone has some form of physical suffering, medical suffering, and someone else has to help them die. Suicide is of one killing themselves. Um, so there's kind of pathological arguments against it. Um, this is just kind of an interesting aside. Suicide is really the only crime where it is declared illegal that you could be punished for attempting to commit but not succeeding. So that's the only one where if you fail to do it, there's no punishment. Or, or so there is there's punishment, but if you succeed, then there is no punishment. Um, at least from the state's standpoint. Um, it's kind of interesting. But there are some kind of you know other considerations um, when we're looking at more deliberate suicide. There's also uh, what's known as collateral suicide. Um, this is like uh, we call here about suicide bombers and that kind of thing. Like it, this is an issue that comes up. Um, at what point can your rash behavior, like it has effects on other people? Um, 
So even if you have an argument that's in favor of suicide, um, are you permitted to do it if it has these negative effects on other people? And that's something else to consider along with this. So uh, looking at some more uh, deontological arguments. Um, so Kant in particular is going to say killing is always wrong. And there is no exception to that. Another kind of argument against this is that suicide and euthanasia are an affront to God's sovereignty. And so you hear people saying, you know, as long as there's life in those, as long as there's breath in those lungs, um, we should continue to provide support. Um, you see with, uh, particularly with someone like, you know, Mother Teresa and people that are influenced by her, um, that even a life of suffering has value. That there's a value in the midst of suffering. This is actually a very medieval view um, that you come closest to God through suffering. Um, and then you have an argument that happiness is really not the end goal of life. Um, that even if you have a life of pain and suffering, that's not reason to not continue on in life. Uh, the categorical, categorical imperative is going to say suicide and euthanasia are the same thing, and they are always prohibited. Remember, you know, the categorical imperative says that you're not going to be able to universalize that, at least according to Kant. It says, you know, if at any time my life isn't going well, um, then I will end it. That that's what the, the maxim that I'm acting upon. Well, that you can't enact that, or otherwise there'll be no one left, so that makes no sense, so we're not going to do it. Um, kind of a roundabout, circuitous way to get there. There's a lot of argument of whether or not it's even a valid application of the categorical imperative, even though Kant seems to think that it is. Um, that's just another consideration with that. Uh, you have consequentialist arguments. Um, kind of consequentialist arguments against suicide or euthanasia are going to say, like, hey, there's a slippery slope. Um, at what point do we draw the line? Uh, you know, at what point is suffering considered enough suffering that we're going to permit it? So perhaps we should not permit it at all. Um, and then you're also going to have people say, well, once someone begins a euthanasia process, and after the drugs are administered, they change their mind and they don't want to. Um, also, I have to think about, like, what are the external pressures? Is someone really making that decision without thinking about all the external pressures? Are they worried that, like, well, I don't want to be a burden to anyone? Um, should that be a consideration, um, either for or against it, uh, and that kind of thing? Um, you can also say that it's antithetical to the purpose of family and the purpose of medicine that to do euthanasia, which is not about um, not doing harm, it's not about the promotion of life, um, but somehow working against the promotion of life. Uh, so that's an argument against it. Um, but then a lot of arguments in favor of especially euthanasia want to talk about quality of life versus the sustaining of life. And that there is some kind of you know, internal calculus, or perhaps it's, it's spoken out loud, um, perhaps not fully deformed, but fuzzy calculus uh, is done about weighing the quality of life versus the sustaining of life and these dual effects and other issues like that. Uh, so these are just issues to think about, ways to think about, approach it. Um, I've kind of said from the game, I'm not going to be real clear and tell you exactly where I'm going to fall on this. Um, last, we're also going to talk about animal rights. We're going to be a little bit uh, more brief here. Um, so there tends to be questions like where do we uh, kind of have the, the, the low side of attention? Does animal rights lead to, are we going to focus more on you know, anthropocentric views, like how does it work with man, zoocentric, how does it work with you know, animal life? Biocentric, all biology, or ecocentrism. Like, how does this question of animal rights affect the larger ecosystem, which is going to include living and non living things? Uh, these are just different considerations to talk about. Um, I'm also, trying to think about what is the moral status of animals? Is it acceptable to have animals for food? Under what circumstances? Is there a point when it could go too far that it's not acceptable? Um, you have questions with the, the raising of chickens and or with pigs. Like, do we need to have, um, you know, free-range chickens? Is that considered now acceptable? Um, the way that some animals are treated is considered particularly abusive. So at what point does that go too far? Um, what about the ownership of animals? You know, you have, you have extreme groups of PETA that say ownership of any animal is always wrong. Um, but kind of more extreme. Is it acceptable to use animals for sport? Um... You know, Spain still has bullfighting, but you can also talk more along the lines of like horse racing and polo. And like, is that acceptable? Um, you're using an animal. Um, do animals have the same moral rights that humans do? And if not, 
how different are those rights? Um, is it acceptable to use them for experimentation? Different questions like that. Um, so are animals, again, to rephrase that question, are animals morally distinct from people? They may be biologically distinct, they may be cognitively distinct, but are they morally distinct? And if so, how? Is sentience, has the ability to recognize oneself, a distinguishing factor from other created living things? Well, clearly we have evidence that dolphins have a form of sentience, um, certain primates have a form of sentience, but they're able to recognize themselves, to think of themselves and their being. Um, so where do we draw that line and that distinction? Uh, big question comes, is it necessary to eat meat? Um, do you have, you know, a, a good argument for it? And you say, well, like, well, it doesn't really matter. Well, then you have the flip side. Okay, well, then what makes humans of sufficient moral worth that we don't need to eat meat? Or what makes us of sufficient worth that um, we don't do human experimentation, but we do animal experimentation? These are just different questions to start thinking about. What about animal sacrifices? Like, so Old Testament has a lot of animal sacrifices. Do we chalk that up as misguided uh, from the time frame? Or do we say, like, no, that would, you know, if God would still want animal sacrifices, that'd be perfectly acceptable today. Um, is it acceptable to have meat and sport and that kind of thing, provided that you minimize the pain that the animal is feeling? So, again, these are just bigger questions to start thinking about as we start thinking about through and through all of these issues. Um, that's kind of where we're going to end today as far as like the overview lecture. Uh, we're going to have some questions on the discussion page. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll join kind of in the conversation there a little bit. We'll ask more pointed questions about some of the readings and different things like that. So thank you very much. Uh, and I will, uh, you'll hear from me again next time.